For the News and Observer, I'm Dawn Vaughn, your host for this episode of Under the Dome for the week of June 19th, 2023. Today's Juneteenth. A lot of people are off work uh, today for the government holiday. So if you're listening to this today or or on Tuesday, it's going to be another uh, interesting week at the legislature. Uh, Today, I'm here with my politics team colleague, Kyle Ingram. And we're going to talk about boards, but we won't bore you. Um, thank you for laughing at my joke in advance. Uh, the Board of Elections, lots of different boards and commissions, and all of this has to do with election day voting, separation of powers, all of it. So Kyle, let's start with what you've been covering, these two different bills that have to do with elections. So what's the one about boards? Right, so we've got two big elections bills coming up. The first one though that you mentioned is dealing with restructuring how the State Board of Elections works. So right now, the way it works is it's a five-member board, and the majority on that board is appointed by the governor. So that means since 2017, it's been a Democratic-controlled institution in the state. But what this bill would do is expand it to eight members and make it evenly split between the parties. So there would be four Republicans and four Democrats, and it takes the appointment authority away from the governor. So this would give it to the top two legislative leaders of each party, the uh, Senate president and the Speaker of the House, and then the minority leaders, They get to appoint those uh, members, and it becomes an eight-member district. So what's the point? Well, the point is they're saying that the way it's currently set up gives Democrats a partisan advantage or whichever party controls the governorship. So they're saying that, you know, elections should be a nonpartisan, neutral sort of institution. So if we make this evenly split, then we're going to get that result. So what if there's a tie? I think you wrote about that, right? (laughs) That's a question we've all had. So the legislation lays out two scenarios in which they tell you how they would deal with the tie. So one of the things the state board has to do is elect an executive or hire an executive director and hire a chair. And the executive director has a lot of discretion to oversee how elections are run. They're not actually a member of the board, but they work for the board. And the legislation says that if the state board can't come to an agreement to hire an executive director or a chair within 30 days, then it goes to the legislature to decide that. But state board has to make a lot more decisions than just whether or not to hire a chair or an executive director. And there's no no provision laid out in the legislation that says what's going to happen if they tie on those. So we had a gaggle with Senate Leader Berger after session, I guess on Thursday, and someone had asked about that. And he mentioned that they'll be around. It was like, what if you're not in session? Uh, And he said they'll be around at least in the fall for redistricting and, and could take care of that. Would that actually work? Sorry. Like that the legislature would be in session to handle anything that they need to do for it. Well, that's the thing. So this doesn't apply just to the state board, actually. This Mm -hmm. is also making a change to all county boards of elections. We have 100 counties in North Carolina. We have 100 county boards of election. And this makes the same change that it does to the state board to all of those. So now all of those positions, which are currently appointed by the governor, have a majority of the governor's party. They now become evenly split between Republicans and Democrats, and they have to be appointed by the legislature. So people have brought up, Democrats in the legislature have brought up, what happens if there's vacancies in these 100 different county boards and we're not in session to fill it? And I haven't really heard an explanation on that yet. All right. So what's our other election or it's the omnibus, which yes. means it's a lot of things, right? <laughs> so what are what are the key points there? And, and again, you know, as, as you all are listening to this at the beginning of the week, the bill might change again. Yes. Uh, Speaker Moore indicated that um, the House might want to switch things up. So we don't know what the final version will look like. So mm-hmm. what's like the 10,000 foot, mm-hmm. like here are the main things that we need to know. And for the previous bill we discussed too, I think right. we will definitely see changes on that. But the omnibus is looking to institute a variety of what they call election integrity measures. Um, they've been put pushed for by conservative election groups since the 2020 election. So I think the headliner with this one is that it's going to get rid of this three-day grace period we have for absentee ballots. So currently, if you vote absentee, as long as your ballot is postmarked by the election date, it can still count if it gets in three days later. This gets rid of that. It says it has to be in uh, by 7.30 p.m. on the day of the election. 
So that's the big one. But it's got a lot of other smaller changes in it as well. Um, one thing is in 2020, there was a lot of private grants used to help fund election administration in North Carolina specifically. Um, and those would be banned under this legislation. There's no more private money for election administration. It also says that if you are using same day registration as a voter, which you can do during early voting, you have to cast a provisional ballot. And provisional ballots are ones that are held aside until the board, the county board of elections can determine if you're eligible to vote in that election. Unless you bring certain documents, then they'll let you vote a regular one. Uh, some other things that wants to institute a signature matching requirement, so they would use new technology to make sure that the signature you use to vote matches the signature that you've put on file with different state agencies, um, and a, a few other things as well. What are we looking at as far as like the um, additional layers of bureaucracy, I guess? Is there, uh, is this going to be a lot of logistics of timing and paperwork and staff, or is that even anything that's being discussed yet? That's a good question. Um, I think some of the headliners, like when we think about eliminating that grace period for absentee ballots, I don't see a ton of bureaucracy going into work to do that because it's just taking something away. But there's a lot of things that they haven't necessarily laid out a plan for. One thing the legislation wants to do is create, it says it wants to create two-factor authentication for anyone doing an absentee ballot. But it was brought up in committee, you know, someone asked, what do you mean? Like, what? how would that practically work? And one of the bill sponsors said they didn't know and they'd have to figure that out. So I think there's a lot of work left to be done on figuring out how some of these things will work practically. And, you know, the state board is already going to have to be implementing photo ID requirements in the upcoming elections because of the Supreme Court case. And they haven't been granted any extra resources to implement that, nor any of these omnibus changes. So we're waiting to see how that comes out in budget negotiations. So where is it? Is it in rules now? Like where does it stand as people are listening to this Monday, Tuesday? So it was approved by both of the ones were approved by Senate redistricting, if I'm not wrong, um, Senate redistricting and elections. And then after that, it would go to Senate rules, I believe. Okay. And then from there, we'll have maybe more of their discussion and, and whatever changes that we'll, we'll see on that. So mm -hmm. another bill about boards, which is like more interesting than it sounds when you mention something about boards, um, has a lot to do with separation of powers. And so the latest on that is it's in conference, but they haven't actually talked yet. And the people that are on the conference committee are all the, the top uh, Republicans in, in both chambers. So that means that whatever they decide is obviously going to happen um, and they'll meet when they feel like it and and sort that out and what this one would do it again it does take away uh, the governor's um, appointments to some boards and commissions and they're they're basically it's going to end up probably a test for the for the state supreme court so there's sort of a grab bag of things in it and it's um, not all boards and commissions i think it drops it down by maybe 20 or so um, as far as uh, that the governor gets to uh, appoint. It also would immediately, everyone on Department of Transportation board would be out of a job um, at the end of the month. So that's more abrupt, that's in there. And then also one other thing that they're trying, which I could see end up um, ending up in court, is that uh, they're, they're trying to say that the separation of powers still stands because they're giving the appointment to a council of state member instead of the governor and saying that that's the executive branch so that counts but if you look at the constitution it says governor so we'll have to see how that would actually sort out and what of course the court is republican majority now is previously democrat majority uh, so we'll see if that stands and the three council of state uh, positions that get to a point happen to be held by Republicans now conveniently, but of course that could change. And it's, um, I believe, Treasurer, Department of Insurance, and Department of Agriculture. So um, the Treasurer won't be the same. That's Del Falwell, who's running for governor. Uh, we don't know yet. I don't think if uh, Commissioner Troxler is running again or if Insurance Commissioner Kazi is running again. Uh, maybe Kazi said he was. I'm not, I'm not sure the status of that. If you're listening, Council of State members, tell us if you're running for, <laughs> for re-election or not as we run down the line of, um, of who's running. Speaking of that, um, we do have this sort of running story updating every time people get in. And, and I could see that the lieutenant governor primary will probably be as big a field as it was the last round when it was a whopping 17 people wow. um, between both parties who wanted to be lieutenant governor, a job that doesn't really have 
almost any power at all, except speaking of boards, you sit on some boards. And if uh, this legislation comes to pass, like running for the job above that governor, you're going to have even even less uh, power. I believe our uh, one of our former colleagues, uh, um, Colin Campbell, that's our press corps colleague now, uh, quipped that you know the governor would have about as much power as a as a city manager. And city managers actually do have a lot of power, but in a very different way. So <laughs> anyway, um, we will talk a little bit about a little bit more about that bill when we come back, and then headliner of the week, including some really big North Carolina names that are also national names and what they've been up to. So we'll be right back. You're listening to Under the Dome. I'm News and Observer State Capitol Bureau Chief Don Vaughn here with my politics team colleague, Kyle Ingram. So before the break, we were talking about non-boring boards and legislation and what it all means. Um, and the one that I've been talking about is this uh, changing to appointment power of um, currently anyway, Governor Cooper. So all these bills taking away the governor's appointments, is this about Cooper or is this something else? It's a little bit about Cooper because one time when I was asking Speaker Moore about it, he brought up the COVID restrictions and basically that they're still mad at Cooper for all of that, um, but not really. They basically already passed that and that law changed and started uh, this past year, which limits how long and how consecutively a governor can issue executive orders during, during states of emergency. So that basically got it on their radar, but Cooper's going to be out of here in, I guess, a year and a half now. And so it's not about him. It's basically about, um, I don't think there's any other Democrat running. It seems like everyone is coalesced around Attorney General Josh Stein, that he will be the Democratic nominee. And then with Republicans, it appears that Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson is the front runner. It may not. It could be former Congressman Mark Walker at some point, or as we mentioned earlier, Treasurer Falwell is running, or anyone else that still gets in. Because even though we talk about like, oh, Cooper's almost done, but a year and a half is actually a very long time. Mm -hmm. And there are new maps and other people that may want to not run for what they're in now and want to do something else in the fall after those after those maps come out. So the race could totally change again. So theoretically, they're doing it as a potentially anti-Stein or anti-Robinson or so on within their own party. But again, I think the core of it is that the General Assembly wants the most power. And that's kind of a North Carolina thing anyway. And it, there's already a lot. Like we were saying, there's like Lieutenant Governor has almost no power for anything. And the governor, they're trying to limit even more power and give m other power more to the, the legislature. And the argument on uh, for those in favor of that is that the General Assembly is closer to the people because yeah. it's a lot more of them, 50 in the Senate, 100 20 in the house that are elected in all these districts whatever you think of what those districts look like you know on a map um, but they're actually more uh, more connected and they should be more powerful so it's kind of fun to to cover and to watch and i'm sure those wonky people that are listening just thinking about like what does this actually mean with the separation of the branches and the powers and and all of that and now, because the Supreme Court has flipped to the other party, and so much of the court decisions lately fall along party lines, we'll kind of see how that how that pans out. So, anyway, um, so that's we hope you didn't bore you with the uh, board talk, but there's going to be probably some more drama with that before the final versions go through these last weeks, maybe of the legislative session. Um, if we had to, um, now that you can bet as of next year. Um, <laughs> In uh, sports betting, anyway, in North Carolina, what would you? What what day do you think we're gonna adjourn this summer? Oh gosh, um, I don't know. I think we're thinking around mid July now, right? Mm -hmm. July fourteenth, maybe yeah. July twenty first. And we haven't gotten really any updates on budget negotiations recently, so no. no idea how far along they are with that. I mean, they're both kind of dug in, and it's big stuff. It's the finance package primarily. Um, but, you know, how much you want to tax people or not is a pretty big deal. And if they do actually get it in before the end of the month, we're talking, if you guys are listening to this on 19th, 20th, 21st, whatever day of the week, that's what, like 10 days to, to shove in whatever final decision in a really massive document. Mm -hmm. So um, please 
please take your time and don't get anything <laughs> wrong. <laughs> Lawmakers and staff, I'm sure the staff that have to spend all the time um, working on it, doing the actual work, you know, um, will have um, a lot of long hours. And, and it's not just the finance package, it's other stuff they're arguing about too with reserves, which is tied to it. Do you want to cut taxes? Do you want to save more money? And then also exactly how much money are teachers um, getting for a raise for their base pay, which is set by the state or state employees. So tens of thousands of people are waiting. But it's not like it's new that it would, if it didn't happen until later in July, that's almost early in North Carolina time since sometimes the budget comes at Thanksgiving, so, or never, like in 2019. So anyway, um, let's get on to our picks for headliner of the week. Um, Kyle, who or what is your headliner of the week? So my headliner this week is going to be Michael Jordan. He just announced he's going to be selling his majority stake in the Charlotte Hornets. You know, I don't keep up that much with sports, but I did go to UNC Chapel Hill, just recently graduated. And since I graduated in 2023, I am the Jordan year because Michael Jordan was number 23, I'm told, in basketball. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, speaking of uh, North Carolinians uh, that have uh, become on the national scene, another one from government is on the national scene. I'm sure everyone has already heard by now. It's official that the former North Carolina DHHS secretary, Dr. Mandy Cohen, is President Biden's pick to have the CDC. And her time in North Carolina, and she still lives here right, until she moves. Uh, the past year, maybe two years now, she's been in the private sector but she had been at DHHS for a while, and she had worked in the federal government before um, coming down here, but her career really up until this point has is, is been defined by her um, COVID response for North Carolina. And those of you who are listening and were in North Carolina or following politics and government during the years of COVID, you probably recognize my voice from saying that's Don Vaughn with the News and Observer calling to ask Cooper <laughs> and Cohen 10 questions when they would have it remote um, once a week, sometimes twice a week, week after week after week after week, where she talked about the three W's and the dimmer switch approach. And I would ask, well, why? And why is it only this percent of occupancy? You can see for this and that, and it was a really, um, it was, it's thankfully all in the all in the past now. I think for for everyone, but anyway, that's why everybody uh, is familiar with Cohen on North Carolina, and then of course the national stage that she'll have. There's no current, uh, of course, COVID and other diseases are still around, but I'm sure there'll be something else that'll that'll define her her federal government career. And there'll be a lot more scrutiny, I think, of looking back at what um, North Carolina did and how they handled everything. But um, we've got stories up you can read about, you know, who she is in the background and what it was, what it was all like then. So anyway, Michael Jordan, Mandy Cohen. So um, for I guess the we're out of time. Um, I'm Don Vaughn for myself and Kyle Ingram. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.